Well, first, I want to say thank you for inviting me out here. Uh, I don't get to have this kind of experience very often, and I do appreciate it. I've spent 22 years on this town school board, and so if we had opportunities to meet and greet students, we appreciate the opportunity to do so. Uh, I was a little surprised Carl didn't mention that Dove Chocolate, the Elizabeth town is the home of Dove Chocolate. So those of you who are new and didn't know that, uh, that's relatively recent in years. Uh, I'm having my high school class reunion and sent out letters to everybody and I pointed out to them that since they were in Elizabethtown last, we have become the Dove chocolate capital of the world. So, okay. I've been in banking for 49 years. I've been in the same market. There are not many who can say that they've been through only one merger and one name change in those 49 years. But I have an affinity for small business lending and that's been what I've done through most of that time in my community. The heartbeat of the American economy is the small and the mid-sized business. These people are the risk takers in our society. There are, according to the last census report, 27 million businesses in the country. And roughly 75% of them do not have a payroll, meaning they're sole proprietorships. Of the remaining 6 million, 5.1 employ 19 or less people. So approximately 21 million people plus families are supported by small business. And don't forget the 21 million businesses that are sold for private shares and their family. So you can see that when they talk about what's going to pull us out of the recession, it'll have to be the small business. The first statistic that I really want to point out to you is that one in four, 25% of new businesses fail in the first year, and 50% fail before five years. The survival rate is not good, but it does demonstrate the strong entrepreneurial strength that the American people have had. So why do they fail? lack of capital, a poor business plan, or do they lack the passion and the stamina to carry it through? You decide. Each of those who start a new business end up dealing themselves their own fate. I've been dealing in small business for many years but in the last three, I felt as though I'm at the top of the heap. Booking eight to ten million dollars in new small business loans per year during the worst recession in your life and mine. This tells me that even in the worst of times, the entrepreneurial spirit burns bright in America. So let's get to it. What do we need to start a small business? First, we need an idea, a passion, if you will, a commitment to constant 24-7 responsibility. In some respects, it's like getting a young puppy <coughs> in the household. That happened to me about two years ago, and I'm reminded by everybody that I just took on 15 years of responsibility. You just can't get away from it. Starting a business is going to be exactly the same thing. No one else is going to assume that responsibility. So be sure of what you're doing is what you want to do. Second, a plan. 
not a passionate dialogue indicating what a great your idea is, and that it's an over-the-top type of idea, but a business plan that will provide current financial data, three years if possible, include a personal financial statement, present sources of income, projections, <coughs> cost of startup, the use of the funds. All this information needs to be supported with the evidence of how you derived interest. In the last 10 years, I have seen several plans with regard to our downtown hotel. In every case, it was determined that the best plan for success of that hotel would be to develop the second and third floors. But to do that, it needed an elevator. These business plans had costs ranging from fifty to $150,000 for the installation and meeting the L&I requirement. My point is, do your homework. Support the data that you put in your plan. Remember, the plan is not just for banks purposes to or to convince investors that it is a viable project. The plan should be a tool, your tool. It should be the deciding factor for you that the idea will succeed. So back up the plan. Remember, one in four fail in the first year. Somebody is going to eat that loss. You, your lender, or maybe your investor. Third, the bank will follow the five C's of credit. If you've taken any business courses, you always hear about the five C's of credit. What's interesting to me is when I started at the bank and was taking night classes, there were three C's of credit. Somewhere over the years, it became five. The first one is capital. What do you have? What skin do you have to put in the game? Are you willing to pledge your assets? You'd be surprised at the number who say, I don't want to put anything into it personally. I want to borrow the funds. It's not going to work. Remember, private loans are not capital. They are debts that need to be repaid. The second C is cash flow. How does the debt get repaid? How do we cover the shortfall during the startup period? I have a lot of people who indicate that I don't expect to make any money for the first three years. I said, well, how are you going to make the payments if you're not going to make any money? You have to have a plan. Is there secondary income? That is, does the spouse work? Are you keeping your present job? And how do you repay the debt if the business fails? Today, our federal guidelines in bank examination push the bank to have policies in place that require 1.2 to 1.25 debt ratio. In other words, for every dollar of debt payment, we need to have 1.2 net operating income. A few years back, they used to accept a ratio of 1 to 1, and that was sufficient especially if we had secondary income to support the individual. Existing businesses today are risk rated. To avoid a risk rating, we need to have a 1.1 debt ratio or you simply become rated. This becomes costly to the bank. People say, what does it mean to be a risk rated loan? 
can tell you a little bit about the economy right now as to the fact that banks have lost money in the first, second, third year of the recession. The problem with that was that these banks had loans that became risk rated. Therefore, they had to take funds and set them aside for additional reserves to cover those loans. It was a requirement. Those funds came off the bottom line, took profits for them. I can assure you we are pulling out of the recession at this point because we're having less and less risk-rated loans. So therefore, we can reduce those reserves and put more money back into the bottom line. It certainly becomes expensive for the bank to have loans that become risk free. And we certainly are not going to book a loan that doesn't meet those requirements of the debt ratio and have to set funds aside. loan to value seems to be an accepted amount with the general public, but it's not necessarily sufficient. Not in this economic context. 70 to 75 percent loan to value is much more acceptable. It depends on the uniqueness of the real estate. Does it have varied or adaptable uses that make it more marketable? And then we have the question of what is acceptable collateral. We have two types of collateral. Type A is adequate collateral, commercial residential real estate. Type B is margin equipment, inventory, accounts receivable, vehicles. <coughs> marginal collateral, we often use a loan to value of 50%. Some say, well, that doesn't seem fair. It looks so good on paper to have those assets. But equipment can be sold, inventory can be sold, receivables can be collected, and the debt not reduced. It's a little difficult to get rid of real estate without the lender being involved with a lien that's reported on the property. Equipment, equipment can be sold in the inventory, and many times if the collector, if the bank takes that collateral back, they may get 20 to 20% of its value. The old saying about 10 cents on the dollar isn't just a cliche, it's a reality. An interesting illustration just recently where a person was opening a restaurant and they came up with their automated cashier system and they found a restaurant that had failed. And so they were able to buy it for 10 cents on the dollar. The only problem was once they had it, the software was not compatible with what they needed at the restaurant. So then they were in the fix because they had to go pay the top price for the software. So it gets a little questionable as to whether we really want to take those type of assets, those marginal assets, as cloud. We take them, but it's more of a defensive move than it is something that we're looking for a payment. Let's talk about real estate for a minute. <coughs> loans made in the last five to seven years 
at 80%, and in some cases 90% was the value, have minimally been reduced in the first five years of the loan. Along comes the recession, <coughs> and residential and commercial properties drop 30 40%. Now where are we? Even here in central Pennsylvania, where we have such a diverse economy, the property values seem to hold during a recession. They still dropped 20 to 30 percent. So we have to be careful that we have the correct margin when we hold that collateral. Fourth C is credit. Credit is not overlooked by the banks. <clears throat> Just because you have such a great idea, or that you have written such a super business plan. If you have bad credit, you better have the best explanation available. Don't take these words lightly. If you have bad credit, it's going to be difficult to get a loan. The credit you're building today could affect your great idea tomorrow. So take it seriously. <coughs> character. I guess the first thing I say about character is don't email the banker your business in and see him. I want to be face to face with you. I want to dialogue with you. I want to experience your passion. I want to get to know you. And I want to assess your character and integrity. Items that are very hard to validate. But face to face is the only way I know to do it. Your reputation is important. Have you walked away from previous ventures? Are you open and honest in your presentation? Now, any of these C's of credit may have weaknesses, but there are programs out there to help overcome some obstacles. There's SBA loans, there's SCORE, there's Community First Fund. These are all organizations that are there to help small business get started. But remember, these <coughs> programs are there to help overcome weaknesses. And a weakness is often offset with a price. So there is no free lunch. In conclusion, <coughs> There are times when the prudent banker makes decisions that simply protect the bank or the investor. He may talk you out of the venture because it is the right thing to do. But there is still room in today's small business lending to make loans because it is the right thing to do. So be thorough in your preparation for the plan. Interesting enough, I've had some good friends that have come in to me and they asked the question, I think I want to start a business. And I said, you think so? Well, then I think I have a question. Do you want me to talk you into it or out of it? I want to know how strong you feel about it. And that's what we're trying to get out of that individual. Our last example, one last example, a customer who I had in business for over 30 years, same bank, never missed a payment, A1 customer, decides to take on a new venture in addition to his existing business. The recession set in, his present business, strain. His new venture 
is beyond going back because we need to complete the project. It was a construction project. His spouse was losing the job due to cutbacks. There goes the second source of income. Final appraisal came in. Upon completion of the construction, and the loan to value is underwater. Remember, the customer never missed a payment through it all. So what do we as a bank do in a case like that? Well, the loan obviously becomes risk rated. Reserves need to be set aside, and that is very costly. Do we increase the loan rate because we have not met the guidelines of the debt ratio? That will only exasperate the problem. Do we force a sale? If we do, the property is insufficient to cover the debt. Or do we try to refinance and work with the customer and buy time for improvement to occur? In this case, I'm proud to say that we did stay with the business. They have been cooperative with us, and now there is daylight at the end of their tunnel. I appreciate very much the invitation to be here. I hope what I had to share was beneficial. I apologize for not having a handout, but I now would entertain any questions that you might have. this in all honesty the banker's role becomes how can I make it work but I'm not going to go down that road until I'm sold on the fact that it's a good idea and we do get a lot of inquiries for businesses that are not good ideas if you've been in town now for two weeks for two years we're known to have a pizza shop on every corner. I don't get too excited when somebody comes in and says, I want to open a new pizza shop. Some of those ideas, they may be good managers, they may be able to do it, but there's a certain something out there as isn't the right business at this point. Others? Do you have a minimum credit score that you look for? For uh, individuals, maybe, or when they apply for a business loan? Individuals who apply for small loans, we do pull credits on those. And if you have a credit score, which is very similar to what happens with mortgage lending the same way, if you have a credit score that's under 660, it doesn't write you off. <coughs> it just means there's another weakness. Okay? If you have a credit score of 700, I've heard people say, hey, it's a good score. But a good score does not make the loan work and be repaid. So it is one of the factors. Yeah. Others? Yeah. What is the most common financial obstacles that small businesses usually run into? Like Insufficient capital to get started. the recession hit we had a number of people who were laid off they went through their capital their savings that they might have had available and then they decided I'm going to go back to school I'm going to go learn how to open my own business and they have nothing to put into it like that or that's the idea of sustaining very few businesses start off with a profit so that's sustaining the loss. What's the suggestion of the capital to start a small business? Depends on the project. It's going to depend a lot on those projections as to when you reach your break even. <coughs>
what's one of the biggest mistakes that business owners make when looking for investors? The honest answer is they're looking for a few easy hours to put into their project. And they make that mistake. They forget that that investor is really a partner of sorts. And so they have to provide for him the same plan or they should provide the same plan they provide to me, the same plan they provide for themselves to be satisfied that this will work. And that's where they fall short sometimes. Yeah, when you're looking at the credit score, do you just look at the number or like the reasons behind it? Basically, they look at the score. If it's a weak score, then obviously you dig into it a little bit. For instance, there are uh, many times medical um, reports in the credit file are disregarded. Probably not correct to be disregarded because they were put there for a reason. But we've all had experiences with insurance claims, <coughs> payments for that type of thing, and therefore somebody's credit scores broke down. The other big problem with credit scores are the person goes shopping for a car and they go into five different dealerships, you better believe they usually end up having five different inquiries into their credit. That's a negative on your credit report. Does it make sense? In theory, the more times you request credit, the less or the more risky you are. So I'm not sure I like that, but it's in that mix, it's in that equation for the credit score. And you mentioned about the SBA score. So my understanding on those was the SBA gets on them for more startups, and the score is usually, uh, they usually take the library role. One, so one of the biggest advantages right now for SBA is that where you have a shortfall in collateral, SBA will step in and give us a guarantee. That may be a 70% guarantee of the total debt. Uh, that's the federal government's way of saying we want entrepreneurs to go out there and start small businesses, and that's why they do that. Uh, during this recession, getting SBA loans seemed to be a lot easier than it was prior to the recession. But remember, you pay a price. It isn't as equitable as bank finance. What's the difference between SGA and microfinance? And the microfinance? Still oh, the microcredit. The same, same type of thing. It depends uh, who's backing it in this case. Uh, you have to remember an SBA loan, the government is not putting the money up. They're just putting the guarantee up, the banks are putting up. But there's, there are probably dozens of groups out there. I only mentioned two or three. SCORE, on the other hand, is more of a management tool helping you to get started. So. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I was wondering,
attached to them in the act, which they did. And they pay a fine and they move on. Finally, the business closed, but a couple of the principals tried to start another business. Now the question is, is that the type of individual that I really want to do in business with? Uh, this was not something that I just had to validate myself. It was something that was in the paper, we all knew about it. So you're not too anxious to jump into that kind of situation. That's just an illustration of actual environmental thing. The environment also having to do with the economy and where you hear of people uh, pulling some shams on individuals. I had two young fellows who came into my office, both from Lancaster, and this had to be 18, 20 years ago. And they had all kinds of ideas. They were fresh out of college and they were ready to go out and buy rental properties and take off. And they were getting the sellers to leave the funds in the property and they were off and moving. And then about 10, 12 years later, I saw in the paper where they were arrested for not paying back these individuals, shamming them on the value of their properties, mostly they were retired people and so forth. Again, it was publicized in papers. When uh, I got involved in a larger market than Elizabethtown, it was funny how their name cropped up again. So I'm not too anxious to step in to see this. It does happen. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, character of the, the party that's trying to secure a loan? How important that is? What kind of things you all look at in terms of a uh, party's character? What relevance does that really have in terms of their ability to, to pay back the, the obligation? I can give you a, a very good illustration of a coffee shop that I financed one time over in Brooklyn. It was sold, uh, and the buyer came in, and I financed the coffee shop for the new buyer. They immediately started to expand, and they moved to two locations. One in a neighboring town. Then they were operating two of those locations. And to make a long story short, it eventually failed. Their overhead was just too high. They could not make a dollar selling coffee enough to pay their debt. From the very first day I met that lady, she said to me, I will pay you regardless of what happens. If I have to cash in this, if I have to sell my house, if I have to do something with our retirement. Many people will say that. But ascertaining their character as the type of individual who does not want to file bankruptcy, does not want to stick the investor. She did just that. Still has a small balance left on the loan, but in the last three years, as she became of age, she pulled certain amounts out of her retirement and paid the debt down. We were able to finance a new house for her. All of that was built around the character and the integrity of the individual who said, I'm not going to let you stuck with my failure in business. So it does become very important. Uh, as far as that character is often reflected in the credit school. You see credit cards go up. You look at it and after a while they go back. It's a common thing today for young people to obtain credit cards with little trouble. Any 
immediately they start to draw them out. Which says to me something about the character of the young person. If I see that in a credit report, I'm not going to be too anxious to lend money to somebody in a new venture where I'm taking most of the risk based on their past history. Okay. <laughs> I have new glasses. I just see shadows. Uh, we got a few. What about over on this section? We haven't heard from anybody over here yet, other than this set line. Got some questions? Obviously, you have to be good with people. You have to be good with relationships. I was asked one day to comment to our bank at one of our group meetings. And I simply told them that banking is no different than many other aspects, is its relationships. If you don't build the relationships, you're not going to be successful in banking. We can all learn to do the numbers. We can all learn to make it work. But if you don't build the relationship, the person isn't going to have the confidence to come back to you. So what does a banker need to be? I think you have to be a people person. And you have to put yourself in the shoes of the customer. Now, that's not to say that you don't need a business background. Last several years, I did have the opportunity of being like a mentor to some of our branch managers. And I find that very few of them have done anything with taxes other than the short form. <coughs> they have no idea how our tax system works. And if somebody's going to come in with a business, you're going to need to understand that tax return that's coming in. So that becomes important. Did I answer enough for that? And when you even you're in the business lines and when you look at the management of the company, how much uh, important is their experience? And if they're not experienced, their, but if, their experience counts a lot. What if they're very passionate about their business, but you know, like they're startups? Sometimes passion can overtake experience. And in my mind, I want to see the passion. Uh, we all can say we've had a lot of experience, but if you're not passionate in what you're doing, you're not going to be successful. But the experience does, does help. Uh, and I think I've found many businesses today who uh, have gone through the hoops. Uh, they've worked in a restaurant before they decide to open a restaurant. If you were a waste waitress at the hamburger joint down the street, that doesn't necessarily tell me that you can run a restaurant. So it's the kind of experience that's going to make the difference. Um, I have uh, I have three stories that I usually tell people. In the early days, I did a fair amount of agricultural lending. And I had some young farmers who really had a desire to be farmers. But they had nothing. They came from situations where they didn't have a family farm. They didn't have any of that kind of experience. And they worked for local farmers. And eventually, they started to rent some ground. They would buy a piece of equipment. And 
I felt like I was nursing them along. Until today, I have two of those guys left. They're both retired, but they own their farms. And so it was the experience that they gained very young that made the difference in being a successful farmer. Subscribe back when you give out subprime loans for small businesses, or do you tend to kind of dish those off to other lenders? Well, your term of subprime <laughs> that's usually used for mortgages, which help to get us into this space. And we've never participated in the subprime and we would not have done that for businesses either. Susquehanna Bank doesn't believe in collateral, it doesn't believe in cash flow, and so we make our decisions on whether it can be repaid. But you guys bring up another question that I might have skipped over, and that is on the idea of collateral. I often have people come in and they want to offer collateral. I don't really want their collateral. I want the means of the cash flow because I want them to pay the debt. I don't want what they might have as collateral. People tend to forget that. They feel as though approval for a loan should be almost automatic if they have two or three times the amount they're asking for in collateral. But collateral, as they say, does not pay the debt. Cash flow pay. Yeah. Other than the uh, projected time of paying off the loan and, and when they'll be making money, what are some of the first things that you look for um, in a business plan, both good and bad? Well, there, the backup data that I referred to in here is the kind of data that not only does the cash flow and, and so forth, but it also supports why that business is going to succeed in the market that it's in, which does take a little homework. Uh, and that's my example of pizza shops. So, um, the other things that are in that business plan, uh, we obviously want your experience level. We want to understand who it is we're dealing with and what it is we're proposing. And they need to be checking around on the competition. And one of the things that they tend to skip over is a projection. And the projections are nothing more than throwing a dart and picking a number that's going to work. But I want to know how you pick the number. And I had one recently where a fellow had been involved with as a partner with another restaurant that was successful. He took all of their numbers, peeled them back to about 60%, and made his projections based on that type of thing. Was he right? Was he wrong? I, I, I don't know that. But I know that he had a basis for where his projection was coming from. And it wasn't just a gut feeling. Okay. Can, you, can you talk about, uh, we have an entrepreneurship program here. Some of the students will major in entrepreneurship. But can you just talk about working capital and how the inconsistency of cash flow sometimes requires the business to get lines of credit and how those can be used to supplement the irregularity of the cash flow and how that should be managed so that the business doesn't get in trouble. I mean, first of 
first approach at from the standpoint that I really support the entrepreneurial program that we have. And I've been president of the Chamber of Commerce in town now for about six years. And that started, we had a lot of vacant storerooms downtown. I'm not necessarily pleased with what we've done to fill some of those store storefronts. But I know now that we don't have a lot of empty ones around. So we must have done something. But the biggest drawback had been that people with an idea and wanted to start a business could not afford to start up in the overhead of renting a storefront and paying five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month for that. It's one of the reasons why the chamber has become so involved with shops on market that is going to open next month. And that is that so many small businesses have the opportunity to get in there for a few dollars a month to get a business built up to the point where their cash flow can carry a higher overhead. Now to get back to your question on that type of thing, obviously there's going to be shortfalls in every business. And a line of credit is just that. It's to cover some of the shortfall. It does need to be secured, but it is not intended to be permanent financing. So if you start a business in the first three, four months, we're losing a few dollars, that line of credit is where you're going to go to do all the funds, where you're going to take them out of your pocket. But as soon as you can turn the corner and pay that back on that line of credit, the sooner you're on your way to developing the cash flow that's going to make you some money. Lines of credit all too often today look <coughs> at as just a means of getting more financing. And it should be termed that. Lots of individuals come in and they want to buy for their landscaping business a couple pieces of equipment and they want to put them on a line of credit. The end of the season is there and they still owe us for that equipment and they haven't reduced it. Next year they start again, but now they're starting with the line of credit debt. So it becomes important for the purchase of equipment items like that to be amortized over a period of time, usually it dovetails with depreciation schedules. Of course, the government has thrown that in the tizzy with some of these quick, you can depreciate a vehicle all in one year, uh, and you get your tax benefit, but you know that the equipment is still going to be used after that. So normally that type of thing should be termed out. And that in itself helps with the cash flow. Now people say, well, I just put it on my line of credit. But it doesn't go away. So lines of credit, while they're an important tool for any business, they do need to be secure. And they have to be used. The criteria is that they should be paid within one year short-term debt. If you're going to call it a long-term debt, then you better have it set in payments or you're going to be behind the eight ball and the equipment does wear out. So, and if you're carrying <coughs> losses for one year, two years, three years on that line of credit, you're just taking a deeper hole. 